very excited to formally introduce our guests, Don and Richard Showerman of Palouse Heritage. They are innovators and amazing thinkers, and they are here to speak with us today about the grain of truth and <laughs> many grains of truth as it relates to growing grains in the Palouse. And they are uh, Richard's also involved, you've read some of his work earlier in the semester from his work around the Palouse and with the Palouse, the Palouse, Fishhook, Palouse Fishhook Band of the Palouse Tribe as well. So they're amazing people and resources and know a lot of stuff. So I'm excited that you agreed to join us again. And Carl is part of that team. Cheerleader. <laughs> and he'll be videoing the presentation. So without further ado, thank you both again. Thank you. Professor Joe Lee, and uh, great, to, great to see you. I'm, I'm Richard. This is my brother, uh, Don, the entrepreneur of the family and uh, co-founder of the Brain Shed in Spokane and a, a facility here that's uh, soon to open in Pullman. Barnum and Wallop, is that what that's called? Barnum and Wallop. Barnum and Wallop, okay. So uh, he's being modest about all his accomplishments, as is uh, my son Carl. He's, he's, he's actually Lieutenant Carl, a cyber warrior, just spent a year at the National War College. We kidnapped him and brought him back, and uh, glad that he's uh, back uh, with us here uh, 50 years ago. I was here. I'm a golden grad this past oh. year. But yeah, this was like a side, empty side hill, I think, back in those days. So uh, in those days, I, I, and I was in the Air Force uh, about that time, so I, I was afraid of guys like him. So, uh, you know, they have all that metal on their shoulders and everything. So this, this gives me great uh, pleasure to order him around and, uh, and, and do things. And I, as a lowly airman, we shouldn't have such authority. Uh, great to be here and talk about uh, things that I hope you find of, uh, of, of interest. It certainly is timely in this day of environmental needs and, uh, and your future are looking for uh, uh, a, a better world to meet the challenges that some of these will talk about uh, as well as uh, prepare you, I hope, for success in the various career fields that you've chosen. So, um, by the way, I have to say, speaking of uh, birthdays, really, our mother is turning 99 on Saturday. So, if, you know, you're looking for a good time, Indy Cotton Canada is probably the one big thing going on there this weekend. Uh, actually, she wants a low key. She wants a low key. But, I told her, when we break the hundred mark, when we go to the century mark, the year from this weekend, you'll, you'll hear a lot of noise up here about this. So uh, anyway, that's our birthday story. So we've got a ways to go here on this. But happy birthday from all the charm and uh, So uh, what we'll do, we have just a three minute overview, give you a little orientation to some of the work that we've uh, done in recent years. We launched this about 10 years ago now. Um, although Don and I grew up just uh, over the hill from where this photo was taken. This is about the northernmost point of the Palouse River. So if in your mind you have a picture of the county we live in here, Whitman County, this would be right about dead center in the middle, just a little bit to the north, and down around this river bend right here is the northernmost point of the river. The Palouse, I believe, is the longest uh, undammed uh, river in the Pacific Northwest. So it flows for quite a while, and uh, this is that northernmost point. Uh, so we're about 25 miles uh, southeast of this location where we are today. So a brief uh, video to give you a little background, uh, then I'll share for 15, 20 minutes uh, about uh, agrarian agricultural origins of the region, and uh, Don will follow that up with some more practical entrepreneurial aspects. Uh, I think the good and the bad and the ugly, sort of, is that what you're calling it? And, uh, and then after that, if you have questions related to this, we'd be happy to respond. So, uh, so that's what we're looking at, and uh, see here a little about the overall story. That's 
max volume. Palouse Heritage grows land-raised grains in the fertile Palouse region of Washington State, an area fabled for the fertility of its undulating landscapes. Our grains are used for artisan flour as well as malt for craft beer. Land-raised grains, often referred to as heritage or heirloom grains, are ancient pre-hybridized varieties of wheat, barley, oats, rye, and other grains that flourished naturally for centuries throughout the world, where they adapted to local environmental conditions. We specialize in raising land-raised grains that were among those originally grown by the early farm settlers of the Pacific Northwest and colonial America. Only through our own vigorous research have we been able to reintroduce these fascinating historical grain varieties, prompting a growing public interest in our work. We are the only source in the world growing the volume and variety of land-raised grains from this part of American history. Palouse Heritage Seed Stock is grown at our own Palouse Colony Farm. The farm is located along the Palouse River and was originally established in the 1880s by German immigrant farmers from Russia. Our families who operate Palouse Heritage today are the direct descendants of those immigrants. When we re-established the farm just a few years ago, we revived our ancestors' old world farming practices for the sake of environmental preservation and restoration. Because of our commitment to regenerate the land and promote preservation of biodiversity, we do not use GMOs, glyphosate, or synthetic fertilizers. Compared to modern commodity grain flour and malt, our land-raised grain varieties deliver incredibly distinctive flavors, combined with significantly improved nutritional benefits. Bakers, brewers, and restaurants are catching the vision for using healthy, unique land-raised grains in an autonomous regional food economy based on local, rural connections. An example of this model is the Grain Shed, a new restaurant in Spokane, Washington, that sources its flour and brew malt from Palouse Heritage. Focused on the health of the soil and the health of communities our products support. We also value authentic historical heritage and the highest quality food and drink. Thanks for taking a moment to learn about us. fits in the bigger story of the advent of, uh, of Northwest agriculture, uh, which, which, is a, which is a big story. And uh, I don't even remember, I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, statistics and things, and I, I don't think I've embedded a lot of that in here. Uh, but but it, it is worth uh, saying a little about. Um, first, uh, my personal interest is is, is really more in these important notions of heritage. There's a kind of romance about it, but it also has very practical applications for being good stewards of the land and feeling connected to a place wherever you might uh, be from, uh, whether it's here in the Northwest or some other part of the country. Our area was visited by uh, 
the most uh, published author of the early 20th century. His books were only outsold by the Bible. Zane Gray, I don't know if you remember him, but he was a famous Western author, and uh, he traveled here during World War I. Uh, was, uh, now that I'm thinking about this, uh, it, it's an interesting WSU connection, Jolie, because he was uh, feted at a dinner with the Spokane Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he happened to sit near uh, one of the regents from then WSC. And he said, you know, you're always writing all these uh, shoot 'em up bang up <coughs> novels and, you know, writers of the Purple Sage, things like this, we've heard of these books. Uh, he said, you know, you're ought to write about farming. I mean, these are the people who are really connected today to the land. And uh, it, he, in truth, he was already mulling this idea over for reasons I won't go into here. But, uh, but that really spurred him to write uh, this novel uh, that was titled The Desert of Wheat. And, and again, it talks about really the, 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 the romance of agrarianism. This is the uh, lead character, Kurt, <coughs> who's musing as he looks upon the landscapes and thinks the dreaming hills with their precious rustling wheat meant more than even a spirit could tell. Whence the first and original seeds, and where were the sowers back in the ages? Material things lost their significance and were seen clearly. They couldn't last, but the grain, the land, the stars, they would go on with their task. Um, this book uh, also became a bestseller. It was actually made into a movie under a, under a different title, and we've, we've had some fun locating just, just where he was at when he was interviewing people working on this book. <clears throat> and he, he does, he mentions uh, Pullman in other places here. So if you're looking for an interesting read, by the way, um, I'm, I'm not trying to plug Zane Gray here. Uh, the, the book is, I think, still in print, uh, as many of his works are. But uh, he, he's, he was some kind, kind of pan later in the century as, uh, you know, perpetuating uh, some of the great Western uh, mythology. But the, the very interesting thing about this book uh, it, is that it's a kind of anti-war novel. Uh, Kurt heads off to World War I and gets horribly injured. And when he comes back to the Northwest, it's the land that, based uh, really in some ways on what you see his thinking uh, here about considering your place as rooted in a landscape and how special and precious that is, that winds up rescuing him. Um, the narrator, uh, Yuri and that piece uh, introduced some of these terms to you, so we won't go deep into this, but land races, just for your vocabulary, uh, yeah, because it's an important part of our story, are the original pre-hybridized grains. And there are reasons that crops of all kinds are hybridized for disease resistance, often just for higher production, which uh, winds up tampering with uh, what we have found to be very rich flavor profiles. Uh, over the uh, millennia, tens of thousands of uh, varieties of grains adapted to particular locales, uh, hence the, the German sense of the word Land, uh, uh, became, you know, grains became unique to those uh, areas. And yet today, and WSU was deeply involved in this grain research, um, you know, you, you, will, you will find just a handful that are uh, released that are typically grown in our area or other parts of the United States when in fact there are tens of thousands of uh, land races, uh, many of them saved because they do have very valuable qualities and, and, are, and are used even often in hybridization for disease resistance and uh, other, um, other ambulatory values. Uh, the Northwest is home to the National Grain Repository. I'd heard about a place called Aberdeen, Idaho many times. I'd never been there. It's in the far southeastern corner of Idaho. And when we were coming out with Carl from D.C. this last summer, we had an opportunity to visit there. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it's like secured like Fort Knox. I had to do my best to find a way to sneak into the place uh, and get some pictures. Uh, because they know how valuable uh, these seed stocks are. And, and by the way, very sadly, some of the uh, most significant uh, seed repositories in the world 
uh, uh, tragically have been destroyed in the last decade. The war in Ukraine has uh, uh, targeted some of these and uh, wars in the Middle East also. Um, just in terms of that earlier remark I made about the significance of agriculture, uh, you know, we're so surrounded by it, and, and sometimes the, the, it's, it's such a big story, you just kind of take it for granted. I did a little bit of uh, looking into this recently for some other uh, uh, folks I've been working with, just to find out the, the you know, the overall significance of the uh, agricultural budget to the Northwest. And if you take just the 10 counties of southeastern Washington, so that's where we're at, off over toward Yakima and down to uh, Clarkson, okay, so just that 10 county area, six and a half billion dollars in annual gross crop revenues. And then if you run around here, you'll find along many of these highways and places like where I'm from down in the Tri-Cities, uh, uh, you know, value-added entities that turn everything into, you know, from flour to, I can't remember what the latest big plant is that moved into Pasco. Every time we drive by there, there's another big building going in that's making something. I don't know, you know, potato chips or you name it. Uh, anyway, it's another three and a half billion of value added. We're just talking southeastern Washington. So you can add six and a half and three and a half, and you know what that is? Ten billion dollars here in southeastern Washington. That's more than the combined payrolls of Microsoft and Boeing. So, uh, so this is a topic, uh, whether you look at it in these philosophic terms, you know, as Kurt Dorn does through Zane Gray and Desert of Wheat, or, or these very practical uh, aspects uh, financially, uh, we're, we're talking things of significance, even though so many times we just take it for granted, right? Because we can walk across the street up here to the Cub, which was there when I was here 50 years ago, and, uh, you know, get something to eat and satisfy our needs. But, uh, but there, are, there are issues that, that relate to the fragility of the system. And Don will talk a little bit more about that in a sec. But, but here's, here's where that started. This is the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company in 1825, Sir George Simpson, the first of two circumnavigations of the globe. Um, you know, some of you have traveled a bit, and uh, Sir George Simpson was a traveler. Imagine going around the world in the 1820s. I mean, this was an adventure, almost two years, actually, to him to go around. He came here to the Northwest. He came down the Columbia River. He was visiting the far-flung posts of the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay Company, he, he, he was kind of uh, Elon Musk of his day, kind of a uh, uh, you know, big thinker, Bill Gates, and he wanted to consolidate uh, what were among the most prosperous businesses in the world relating to the fur trade. Um, and so four years earlier than this, they had acquired all of the fur trading posts in the Pacific Northwest, Northwest Company, uh, the American, the, uh, sad to report, the American Fur Company went out of business quite early. Uh, but, uh, but other nationals were here, Russian American Fur Company, other, and uh, they established a monopoly. They, they, by, by actually 1821, they were running the whole show in what was then called the Oregon Country. So from here, clear up to British Columbia, Alberta, all that area. Well, take a look there. You can see Sir George, right? Can't miss that guy. Who's running down the Columbia River, you know, wearing a top hat? So I, I'm not sure of how accurate this is, but I will tell you there is something from that canoe trip that's very tangible uh, that we have. I, I usually don't break this out and show people, but but uh, but uh, uh, Professor uh, Jolie has been a special friend to us, and we enjoy coming and sharing with you. Plus, hey, guess what? I'm an old teacher from junior high and high school, so i got to have show and tell all the time. And uh, so this is it. This is, this is what he's got in a cask, wooden cask, in that canoe. He has grain. There was no grain raised in the Pacific Northwest prior to the 1820s. Uh, he said basically to the chief factors in all the posts up and down the great vast Columbia region, 
this is a long way to send your lunch every day. You know, you guys got to start raising your own food rather than us sending these ships across the oceans. So here you go. Start raising your right, raising your own wheat. And uh, it took a little bit of detective work. And in another life, if you're interested, I can tell you how we track this down. Uh, somebody about 1910 was still raising a remnant of that original crop and a USDA, what they call a plant explorer, a botanist, out here, believe it or not, even then, in the early 1900s, they realized the value of germplasm centers and so, so they, they, they collected that. Had he not picked that up, this would have been lost forever. So this is a, this is a soft white wheat uh, called uh, Hudson's Bay, and the nickname was Hudson Bay Week. It's uh, white llamas from southern England, and this was the first grain ever raised in the Pacific Northwest. So you can pass it around there and take a look. It, it, it's not the biggest uh, kernels. Uh, we, we, it, when we, this was from a small plot we had a few years ago. They only part with a little, they treat this like platinum. You know, they give you a tiny few seeds to grow, so it takes a while to grow this out. But uh, but very flavorful, and uh, and thanks to uh, thanks to uh, Sir George, uh, you know, married grains with the great fertile prairies of the Pacific Northwest, vegetable crops, uh, flowers. I mean, these Hudson Bay people like John McLaughlin. They were master growers, and uh, so the forts down there and places like Fort Colville to the north of us uh, and, uh, and uh, numerous others flourished all up and down uh, the great uh, Columbia District. Um, by the way, here in the inland northwest, uh, Fort Colville, he stopped at Fort Colville on that, on that ride you saw in the canoe. He also stopped at Fort Walla Walla, which was not at the city of Walla Walla. It's at uh, what is called Wallula, which is the mouth of the Walla Walla River. And there was a fort there, pretty dry down there, but they set up several fields uh, up the Walla Walla River. We're actually going to be doing a field trip down there and pointing out where some of those are. <clears throat> so these are those places where he came and delivered the grain. Kind of Johnny Appleseed, right? Only it's Johnny Grain Seed and it's Sir George. Fort Colville up there in the top. Here's the great bend of the Columbia. We're right about here. Here's Fort Walla Walla and Fort Vancouver. Others like Fort Nisqually on the coast. And in, in fact, the vast majority of these posts had farms uh, located uh, all around them. Fort Walla Walla, 30 acres. Fort Nisqually, over by southern Puget Sound. Some of you might be there in the Tacoma area. 1,200 acres under production. Uh, Jolie, I just got this image the other day. Uh, we've talked a little about the first images ever of the Plouffe country, and there are there, there's a famous uh, series of lithographs from the 1860s by uh, our first governor, territorial governor uh, Isaac Stevens. Now you know you guys are here at the university. You're working hard. Uh, you know, up late studying, rooting the cougars on on the weekend, right? So you know you've got lots going on. But let me tell you, before you think there's enough happening in your world to give you a migraine headache, think about Isaac Stevens. He gets appointed territorial governor. Same month, he's appointed superintendent of Indian Affairs for the territory. And by the way, if there's any free time, why don't you become chief surveyor for the Northern Pacific Railroad? He did all three of those jobs simultaneously. He brought an artist with him named Gustavo Sohan. And while the 1860, and by the way, his surveys were the best of all. But uh, Congress said, sorry, we're not going to build the Northern Pacific Railroad first. Because basically, you know, they closed the door. You've watched the news, right? We've got all these arguments going on at the House of Representatives right now back in D.C. And uh, they were all duking it out, too. Are we going to build the central route? Are we going to build the southern route? Are we going to build the northern route? Well, the southern folks wanted the southern Pacific Railroad. And a uh, big argument with Stevens and everybody. And so they settled on the central Union Pacific Railroad. But his surveys were the most meticulous of all. He sent a massive report to Congress in the 1860s. 
and they have these uh, nice lithographs, but they're kind of fuzzy. You know, a lithograph is a, a stone surface that they uh, put a, uh, a treatment on, but then they, you know, pull, color, pull paper with various colors. Just this week, I found out that the image uh, from which the lithograph was actually made, the painting by uh, Gustavus Sohan, a German immigrant, <coughs> that was, uh, it, actually he sketched it and it was painted then by a prominent American artist named John McStanley, uh, is held at uh, the Yale University Art Gallery, which I visited, but I had my, I was there for other reasons, and I did not know that this was in the, it was in their collection, and uh, I don't know when it was put up, but I, I look into this stuff fairly regularly, and uh, just popped up last week. Uh, gee, we could pay 20 questions here, and I know a lot of you are not from, uh, you know, the Inland Northwest maybe, but some of you might be. Anybody want to guess where this picture is drawn from? By the way, Stevens was a prodigious writer. But he, like I said, was doing a lot of other things, right? So he didn't often comment on art, I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, but this was such a stunning view that in his congressional report, he actually says, here is where this sketch was made. Uh, you know, a rare reference so that we can almost walk to this place. Anybody have an idea? Uh, just north of Moscow is what's called Moscow Mountain. So he's on the eastern slope of Moscow Mountain here, looking into uh, Lake Talk County. I, I'm uh, as interested in, in the, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Case has been writing, because I, I've been interested in writing about the changes in this landscape. And uh, this afternoon, uh, one of the Northwest's most prominent landscape uh, photographers, uh, John Clement, a very close friend of mine, is coming here to campus. And uh, uh, I don't know, time is probably going to get away from us, but we're kind of interested in going here. And uh, he would like, in fact, he took a photograph just a few years ago where he thought this was located. I uh, didn't know this image even existed at the time. Uh, but you can see there's been some changes in the land, right? Uh, that little peak on the top left, that was in the center of the previous uh, image that you saw. And uh, so it's interesting to see what kind of environmental changes have happened uh, since that took place. You can see Pyramid Peak here in the middle. This is uh, one of Stevens' outstanding maps. And uh, Pyramid Peak is, is uh, Stepto Peak. So this image is taken from right about there, just north of uh, present Moscow. Um, there were farms when he was here looking at uh, the region. He was, he was surveying for this line, for this railroad, and here he is 30 years after that image I showed you of Sir George Simpson, and already at that time, Native Americans had picked the grain up, and he notes the existence of seven farms along the Lower Snake River from uh, uh, basically the, the mouth of the snake uh, clear up to what is today Lewiston at Alcoa. Well, here's our crop of llamas wheat, and uh, somewhere there it's making the rounds in the jar. Uh, uh, you know, it's a beautiful grain, and uh, the North, inland northwest is, is uniquely adapted in some ways to soft white grains. Uh, so it's a very flavorful grain, and uh, that's a view of where we're at. We're still raising soft white wheat far into the 21st century, and our property that we have on the Palouse, very close to where our uh, ancestors first settled when they came uh, from uh, the Volga region in the 1880s. This is the kind of work they were doing in those days, very labor intensive. Uh, today, with uh, modern machinery, uh, you know, the kind of work that you could do, I don't know if you've ever wielded a scythe, but you know what a scythe is, kind of like a big sickle with a handle on it. Uh, if you're, in, and uh, I don't mean this to be a sexist remark, uh, ladies, but they, they let the men do the sign. I think because the women were smarter and they spent their time bundling the grain and tie it. Let the men go out there and kill themselves wielding these things. They could sigh. If you were a talented sire, big muscled guy, you could sigh about an acre in a, in a 10 to a 12 hour day. An acre is the size of a football field. So that's a lot of work. <clears throat> Anybody want to guess what one of these machines does today? 
about 150 acres. In fact, the bigger ones that are out there can do, I think, close to 200 acres in a day. So it's a, it's a remarkable change that's happened. Uh, well, as I'm wrapping up here, why, why is this relevant for us? And Don's going to go into some more detail. We find that land races may not have the kind of yields that some of the modern grains have, but look what they do have. They have far higher mineral levels than modern cultivars. And by the way, there are very important reasons why uh, elements like magnesium and selenium are really important to you as young people growing up wanting to be healthy and be here uh, for uh, a full lifespan. A fuller brand layer for better digestion, uh, significant generic, uh, genetic variation for disease resistance, and you know what? It's just kind of fun to eat pancakes made with the original grains raised in the Northwest. They're, it's delicious. I, and shame on me for not bringing you a bag of our pancake mix. I should have done that word. Making pancake mix now with this. And, and I'm here to tell you, it, it, is, uh, they, it is delicious. Um, won't take time to go into these details, but you can see here tests done today about how you can rate the nutritional values of these. This one, I will just pause for a minute here as I close, is really interesting because it shows that in all the major uh, categories of nutritional value, not a single one rates in the category of a recent modern cultivar. The primitive grains, the spelts, the land races, in every category exceed the nutritional value of the modern grains because modern grains are hybridized for yield, for price, not for flavor and nutrition. So Don has helped lead the charge to translate land grace grains into products and so Bear, golden bear barley, tracked down in uh, Scotland. We get the word barn from bear. We get the word beer from bear. So you're really going back to the original, and soon you'll be able to find it right here in Pullman, Washington. So whether it's bear barley or oats, turkey red wheat that our ancestors brought, did you know there were no real bread wheats in America until the 1870s? Now it's true, Martha Washington was baking bread for George, but it was with soft white wheat. And it, 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 it's, you know, it falls apart. And uh, when hard red grains were introduced, this revolutionized the American grain industry. I am a pancake lover, and so uh, I'm all about And we, we tracked down the original French crepe grains. Haven't been able to find a lot of interest in this, which is so sad, because it's so delicious. So we're continuing to do what we can to um, promote sustainable utilization of these land races, and um, you know, this might seem farm afield as I finish uh, from the Palouse country, but I, I'm fascinated by this uh, Roman uh, monument. This is the largest uh, uh, Roman gate in existence. It's in northwestern, northeastern France. The reason I have it here is because uh, it's still standing. And when you look back at, uh, you know, what threatened the vitality of the empire, uh, you know, two millennia ago, you're looking at barbarian invasions, dependence on slave labor, political corruption. Some, some of these sound familiar. Uh, but look at today, what we're facing, what you're facing. Biodiversity collapse, global warming biochemical changes to land and water. These aren't problems. I wish they were. These are planetary high risks. These are going to significantly impact and damage quality of life on this planet. And so uh, they found ways to deal with political corruption and barbarian invasion. In some ways they surrendered to some of them. I'm hoping we don't surrender to all these problems and that bright young minds like you will stand up and join with us and others and really try to make the world a better place. So, thanks so much for your kind attention, uh, best wishes and all the good work you're doing, and uh, happy to turn it over here to Brother Tom. 
if I can figure out that. Get out. This is your time. Go. Well, Nick is the smart academic one. That's why mom liked him better than me. Yeah. <laughs> and I've had to live with being good. <laughs> so appropriately, uh, so uh, again, my name is Don. I'm involved in a lot of the regenerative things, a lot of businesses in the eastern Washington and the like. And in honor of Julie, I'm calling this Palouse Landscapes, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So a little bit about, here's the farm, a little bit about what uh, well, Dick and I will cross over a little bit. Hang on, because we'll go fast. We don't have a lot of time. We do want to leave a little bit of time if you guys don't ask any questions. We envision Plus Heritage. So we envision a future where our decisions are strongly guided by social, planetary impact. Our brains cultivate connections, compassion, and purpose. Our farm's unique terroir is guided by our core values. An intrinsic sense of place harmonizing with our local natural world of climate, soils, plants, and practices. It is important to know your farmer. It is more important uh, to know your farmer's practices. A quick question that I'd like to ask uh, for these, uh, but also, and not mandatory, but you want to raise your hand real quick. How many of you are from Washington State? Oh, awesomeness. Uh, how many of you, uh, by connections, are uh, have family, reasonably close, connected to farming or land or agriculture. Uh huh. Cool. And then how many of you uh, also consider to be to climate change, global warming, an existential threat? Cool. And then uh, lastly, how many of you are familiar with the term or, or the tension in terms of Roundup glyphosate? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Good. This is helpful to me for these things. Uh, all right. Palouse Heritage's mission and vision to establish low chemical input heirloom land raised grains as a distinct category in the food and beverage culinary space. To develop a financially viable, vertically, vertically integrated replica platform in supporting the transitions of small medium agricultural enterprises from the centralized industrial commodity carbon based fossil fuel era to a decentralized local, regional, earth friendly environment of flavor, nutrition, health, and sustainability in reconnecting the urban and rural communities. Vertical integration is a form of a business organization in which all the links of supply chain from production to processing to retailing of the final product is under a local operating structure, contrasted to large centralized global transnationals that essentially control the whole food supply chain. So this is the good part. We all love the Palouse country here. These are just photos of my friends. This is all the good thing that we're looking at. The fellow here and his partner are people that are fellows that have taken some of these photos. We have down at the Palouse or the Snake River. We love the snake. This is the uh, Warm Springs uh, 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 orchard down there. These are little pickers picking our lovely little fruit. This is a picture of oops of uh, I don't want to mess that up. That was Rock Lake. Uh, that uh, result of the of the. Missoula ice dam breaking, whatever, that really changed the area down there. This is also just the canvas in bloom at Rock Lake. I love this picture taken by a friend of mine. And again, we're looking at the wheat fields, the contours. This is Kamiak Butte. This is me jumping off of Stepto Butte and having just the vista high up there. And this is Candle, uh, by the way, not me. And again, just a uh, Eastern Washington, the Palouse country is there's worldwide there are photographers that come here. And it's really viewed by these folks as like the Tuscany of North America. Uh, however, we're looking can we see this thing? Yeah. Uh, so what we're looking at is really what's on top of the soil. The plants, the vista, the stars, flowers, crops. But equally what I'm going to talk about is what's going on underneath the ground, underneath the soil, the initial layer. The initial layer is like teeming with life. It's a life organism. 
uh, and it's called microbiome, the close relationship between all of the activity of these life forms. We don't have time to get into technical detail. But they are uh, very similar to the microbiome that you have in your uh, guts, quite frankly. And, and so these are these same things, and there's a relationship between the health of the soil, the health of the plants, the health of the food, and your health that's directly related to what goes on between the interchange of the soil and nutrients to the plants that we, that we uh, consume. Again, uh, natural resources, this is part of our thinking and what we've adopted and what we advocate for. Natural resources are to be respectfully used and managed, which requires an intimate understanding of relationships among environmental systems, indigenous and introduced species, and agricultural practices. The health of individuals and the larger culture is related to the health of the ecosystems, the plains, the forests, the rivers, and the oceans. These are all technical things that are scurry though. However, there is a storm brewing on the land. Existential threats, as Dick was alluding to, uh, can be ignored, but they will not be avoided. And so we view and, and advocate for understanding what are these choices that we make as individuals in determining uh, a great deal of what are the agricultural practices and as that relates to climate change. There's another way to think and live, and it's called agrarianism. There's not so much a philosophy as a practice, an attitude, a loyalty, and a passion all based in close connection with the land. It results in a sound local economy in which producers and consumers are neighbors and in which nature herself becomes a standard for our work and production. A growing community with a mental, emotional, and spiritual condition of knowing that the place, our land, the Palouse country, is shared. So at the end of the day, we're a platform for regenerating our planet. And what we do, we grow the grain, then we convert it into, uh, with our business arrangements, uh, we don't sell on the commodity market, we deal locally, and so we convert the grain that we grow into bread, flour, pancakes, and uh, we make beer with it too. And uh, I'm a good cougar as well, and I occasionally like a beer. That's it. Try to answer your questions if you want. If you have anything at all, yes. Is your like grain and like the bread that you guys like produce with other people? Is that in like our local Safeway? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so we we have a, so we're involved a partner with a brewery, bakery, and restaurant in Spokane called the Grain Shed. We have uh, two other locations in Spokane, so we move the beer and the bread. But on a side note, within hopefully a couple of months, we're opening a location in Paul. Awesome. And so, yeah, so you can, uh, we'll be, the bread will be on down the line. We will be using internally green shed bread, and uh, we'll be uh, bringing our healthy beer and bread uh, from the grain shed down to the pulmonary So keep it on. You'll, we'll get to taste it at our end of year meal again. Awesome, we will make this happen. Yes, I'm meeting with them today, so. Oh, nice. Very good, very good. So yeah, we'll be down, uh, kind of just past, past Birch and Barley here in another couple of months. And uh, yeah, so again, you know, as a, do we have a minute yet or time? We have till 1.20. Oh, yeah, with the 120? Okay, yeah. very cool. Oh, gee. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, Americans tend to like clear beer and white bread. <laughs> and if you go to Europe, you know, in most places, I would say, the beer is cloudy and the, you know, the bread is dark. And, and again, it has fiber, and then these are indicators of, of what, what's good for you. So thanks for the question, and I hope we have it here for you soon. Other questions? Oh, I know I was going to say, too, is that uh, what, what, the, this fork in the road thing, oh, yeah, I'm going to steal your line, the green of truth, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
uh, in kind of this ag world, the food world, there's a fellow named uh, Wendell Berry, who, who's an agrarian philosopher type. And he says, you know, I'm paraphrasing, if you eat, you're participating in agriculture. Because what you spend your dollar on impacts whether or not you're dealing with, say, organic, regenerative, sustainable uh, crops, soils, and the like, and what the end product is that we pick up at the big box stores. And, and also then, uh, if you view these as serious threats, uh, Michael Pollan is a contemporary food writer, author guy, and he says, and you know, if you are participating in agriculture, by your dollar, you're also making a political statement. Because nothing changes at a political basis. Because it's so influenced by the corporate world, without getting into politics, uh, that, that that deal change is by the consumers choosing the fork in the road to which you're going to support. Whether it is healthy or questionable, let's just be nice about it and say questionable. Uh, and, and, and so again, it's very important. And, and so, you know, you young folks are the ones that will face these challenges. And some of you here will also be the ones that will be the thought leaders, and and there'll be supporters, and there will be thought leaders who 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 will uh, find their place, just like finding uh, our place in the Blue Hills or, or wherever. And it doesn't really matter when you leave. Uh, Pullman, I left, I went all over the world. But it's where you plant yourself. You can carry this thinking with you, and then you can just influence your local neighborhood where you're living, or your coffee shop, or the people that you're interacting with. And so this is, you know, finding local your place. But to take this kind of thinking that is about stewardship, of children, your family, your community, your friends, you take that with you, and you become the seed, you see. Then you're in the soil, you become the seed. And, and then you can share these things with you, but that's only if you buy off on the fact that toxicity in the food supply is a, is a very dangerous risk. Is climate change a very dangerous risk? Is political term upheaval going to be a dangerous situation because there are very powerful interests who do not want to change these kind of economic structures. So, political act and all of you participate in agriculture. Yes, ma'am. So, typically, like, artificial foods are um, considerably, like, cheaper and healthier foods are, um, like, considerably more, like, expensive because, like, more natural stuff like that. What do you guys do to help like um, the price differences and, and lower people or lower income people who would like want to eat healthier? Yep. Awesome question. Three things. I think I have there, but I'll be later with that. Number one, so we're vertically integrated. So if we would buy, make our grain, sell it to a, a commodity people who sells it to a baker. The baker then sells it to uh, Dismores or whoever. They're all capturing margins in there. So by having a local supply chain, we reduce the margins and actually can be competitive price. It'll be a little bit higher, yes. Number two, the big thing is that there's a close relationship between giant corporations and government policy. The carbon industry and farming, growing, agriculture, are massively subsidized. That allows them to keep prices low. As opposed to regenerative, organic, there, there is no, there is no incentive. And this is in terms of marketing and flat out production as well. And I had three on my mind and I can only remember two. Perhaps the third would be the uh Immediate costs may be lower now, but long-term health care yeah. costs. Yeah, exactly. That, that, again, that, that's downside. 
you know, that, that's legacy costs is a huge thing. Uh, health industries, you know, like a wreck. And there is these legacy costs that are generational, that are coming on down the pike. That's assuming that you think that there is a relationship between human health and environmental externalities that can affect. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I, I forgot one point though, maybe it'll come. It, 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 it's of really relevance <clears throat> because when you go to the crane shed, I mean, a, a loaf right. of Sean's bread is I don't know, eight bucks, and you go down here to Safeway, and yeah, here's wholesome for two. And, and so you're right on. And, and like Don said, part of it is, uh, you know, corporate ag and commodity production uh, provides low cost incentives for cheap products like that. And that's what's delivered to schools in massive amounts and all the rest because, because of their successful lobbying. So we need bright people like you working the other side of the fence, you know, to say there's another story to this. Uh, so, yeah. And also, uh, granted, Wonder Bread is two bucks or three bucks. Dave's Organic Killer Bread is like six. So you see, we're not that far off. And accessibility is a real issue, especially for lower income folks with families and the like. And so again, that's a, to, to some extent, that's a policy issue. But that's why we advocate for local control in terms of uh, local control in terms of uh, 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 dealing with it. So I call it the five S's. We're focused on, from, this is from building a local grain economy. First of all, it needs to be sustainable. And this is again existential threats with food supply issues. It has to be safe. Health of the soil, health of the planet, health of the community. Oh, for the plant, yeah, I thought I said. And the planet. And also then for securing a local food supply. When we were in Spokane during the COVID stuff, because we had our grain, we had our bakery, all this, uh, things in Safeway and whatever, they didn't have a lot of flour or whatever. We were sending flour direct to, to people in uh, Seattle area because they couldn't get flour. We didn't skip a beat. We had beer and bread for all of our customers the whole time. And, and so that's, you know, really an issue of, uh, you know, food, food sovereignty to, to deal with this, these words that are out there. And also then it's about community building. We don't really go to in downtown, you know, big corporate places. We go to neighborhoods. So we have neighborhood support. You can do the demographics. If you're like in a 5,000 person area, uh, that'll support what we're doing in a grain shed. You could have five grain sheds in, in uh, Spokane. You could have 105 in Seattle, Tacoma. And those are the things that we try to uh, have people consider on the business side. And again, this is the thing with sensible government policy. You can't, this is a guy that we know, uh, the developer hitter was really a serious good person. Sensible government policy. You can't just allow something. This is a policy issue with funding and the like. You develop, the, the development code needs to encourage it. Same with food issues. It's not to allow it, but encourage it. Because now, corporate or federal dollars that you pay your taxes on are going to support the carbon world with all of these negative factors. And they're not supporting uh, people like us. And again, don't be very clear. Uh, don't, so don't, don't support us. I mean, we're like, give us a shot. But support anybody who's organic or sustainable. There's a lot of brands coming on. And it's very difficult for them to survive because it's a David and Goliath story. So back in your hometowns you come from, uh, you know, support those small little breweries, the small little bakeries, all of that kind of stuff too. And, and so we're not giving a big pitch for food heritage here. They'll pull them in farmers market. Mm -hmm. yeah, mar farmers markets are a huge, huge thing. Because there's huge barriers to entry for small guys to get on the retail shelves. 
The big companies pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to all the grocery store chains to say, put my stuff on the shelf. That applies to beer too, bread and product. Little people starting out, you know, they don't simply have that capital to compete on that level. But you can find your core constituency uh, within local neighborhoods. There's a lot of green people. And why are the big companies doing that? Because the green movement people have pull in terms of market placement and buying those kind of products. But again, uh, yeah, food uh, or farms, farm stands and all is like a huge pool. Anything else? When you say the green movement people, are you referring to the, the green revolution? Is that no, what no, 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 no. It's for clarity That's sake. Yeah. No, 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 not green revolution. I'm talking about people now who are oriented to sustainable things, regenerative agriculture, organic. That's the green revolution I'm talking about. And there's lots of different groups that have prioritized different things. So I call this group this subset of consumer pull people who are oriented in different shades of green. They have different things that, you know, maybe they gravitate. Maybe they're interested in soil. Maybe they're interested in gut health. Maybe they're interested in local. So that, you know, there's a hierarchy of about a dozen things that influences the decision making of consumers. And so I just call those shades of green folks. Of which we are, so we're a shade of green too. And, personally, I'm green within me because you guys are so young and you might be involved with this because we're a little bit longer too. So we're not afraid to speak out about it because there aren't too many people that are. Just like, you know, but none of you have intimate knowledge of what's happening with glyphosate and these toxic herbicides that are used. See, that's something we have to work on to try to figure out, uh, raising and elevating the discussion about some of these things. You don't see it on media because been in, 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 in the government policy, I say ExxonMobil, Bayer, uh, Archer Daniels, these huge transnationals, right? Well, their marketing and lobbying budget is a little bit bigger than Ben and & Jerry's ice cream. And, and that's what it's all about, is money. And so there's not this centralized, uh, massive amount of capital that could be directed towards marketing and the like. Uh, and and uh, small people that are, it's like join the revolution. Probably time how you got people here. Oh, we're out of time. Round two. Well, thank you both again. <laughs> <laughs>